It is always a privilege to that the Lord has given us a gift to worship Him, to set aside the Lord's Day, to only focus on Him and what He's done. And as you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 13, I want you to give thought to this, even if you've seen the bulletin. The title of this message is the second part of last week's sermon is loving his own. Contemplating the Lord's Day and that same idea, that same idea that the privilege that belongs to all those that claim Christ, that are believers, that have confessed him as Lord and Savior. I see these these chapters as even a preparation for the church, even today. Um, let, let me read these por- this portion of Scripture. We're going to be going through all the way from verse 1 through 17. But I, I what I want you to understand is, is this, is what I want you to give thought to is that this is something that Christ, through John the Apostle, it's telling you this morning, 2,000 years ago, it's a day before Christ would be crucified, but this is a letter to us. Let, let me read this and, and, again, give thought to this. In verse 1, this is God's infallible and errant and inspired word. Now before the feast, the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father... Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from from supper and laid aside his garments And taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girded with. So he he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you you also should do as I do. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Pray with me. Father, this morning... We want to take pause from all of life and to hear from you. We want to see what your life was demonstrating to us. Not as a mere example, but as a way of life that begins with the transformative work of the gospel. So I pray now that as we look to this passage that we would not miss the point that we would see the directive, the inspiration of your Holy Spirit to understand this 
passage in its context, in its grander scheme, in its grander understanding, that is for your church to understand and to know what it is to serve you and serve each other. We pray these things in Christ's name. Last week, we began a journey of looking at these, this, I would we call the farewell discourse. That Jesus is, is with his disciples, and now he's out, out of any kind of public ministry. And these next chapters, chapters 13 through 17, he's given his farewell. These private moments are some of the deepest lessons that he will teach them and us. And most importantly, to instruct, this instruction comes at the precipice of the cross itself. What is this entrance to this instruction or to these lessons? What is the, the first lesson that we see? None other than humility as a form of love. We don't get, get away quickly from just verse 1 where he's, tell, he's telling us or John instructing us to give thought to how he is about to instruct us. He says, having loving, loved his own that were in the world, he loved them to the end. These next things that he's going to say are based in this, this deep, deep love that he has for his people, his disciples. The most compelling thing about this interaction is that we are learning a lesson from God incarnate. I, I think a lot of times we, we miss this. And, and I've told you this before, that R.C. Sproul kind of tells us this when we read the Gospels, that you want to find the drama. And, and we don't miss this because we look at Christ and we look at his life and we tend to separate his, his humanity and his, his, his Godhead, his, his connection to the triunity of God. And, and we look at this and we say, look at the lesson that God is teaching us. This is God, the, the, the creator of all things. The God of the universe will take upon himself what? What does he do here? He takes upon himself the role of a slave. This alone should cause us to meditate, uh, even in our own elevated thoughts of ourselves. The principles applied from from Matthew 23, verse 12, that says this, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. This is, this is true. And, and that humility begins with, with a surrender to the gospel, right? But 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 also says this, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in proper time. We, we don't desire humility. Listen. As much as humility was, was foreign to Greco-Roman society, the society that John is writing here now, they didn't even have a word for humility. As a matter of fact, the, the writers of the Gospels had to make up a word that did not exist in Grecian culture. This word humility, and we see it, we see it as, as alien even to humanity, to humanity today. There is, there is no one. Listen, we're in an election year, aren't we? I, I couldn't tell you that I, I could not tell you that any of the candidates express any sort of humility. None. I'm not talking politics. I'm saying a virtue that must be in the hearts of men, humility is not at the top of that list. Power, pride, arrogance, yes. Humility, no, not a virtue. And in the church, I, I think I, I, I see this, and, and remember that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Peter is talking to believers Humble yourselves, he says, under the mighty hand of God. 
that he, he, he says this is something to be, to be at the top of your virtues list in your life. It's not something that you decide to, to be someday. It's, it has to shape everything that you are. The God of the universe will gird himself and wash the feet of these men that will eventually leave him to die by himself. So we see this exemplified in, in the life of, of what I see in Scripture when I thought, where can I find this? Where can I find some of the greatest men in the Bible that, that exemplified humility? And, you know, one of my favorite characters you guys obviously have to know is Paul, right? Paul the Apostle. And I, and I see it. I see it at, and remember, this is Thursday. It's the day before Christ would die. And so he has these last words, these last instructions. In the same way, Paul, and, it, and he exemplified this humility of Christ at the end of his own life. Becoming a model of sorts, he, he's, he served, his whole life was a form of service unto the Lord and unto his church. So we see this best demonstrated again in his farewell speech. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. A few pages to your right. Acts 20. And, and I want you to give thought. So give thought to the words that Paul uses. He, he's about to be carted off to Israel, right? And the prophecy had already been foretold about him actually dying in Israel. So he says this. He's speaking to these people in Acts 20, starting in verse 18. Look what he says, starting in the middle of the verse. He says, you yourselves know from the first day that I, that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. He, he begins to speak about these people in Asia Minor, these churches that were planted in Asia Minor. We're talking Ephesus, Philippi. You know, we have these churches that are well-established, all because of his work. He says in verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which come upon me through the plots of the Jews. Serving the Lord with all humility. There, there wasn't an ounce of some sort of look at me. Look what I've built in Paul. Not even a little bit. Look at verse 20. How I did not shrink from, from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from, publicly from house to house. You know, this wasn't like they, they would create events. They wouldn't do that. Paul didn't say, well, let me set out some flyers. Everybody come here. But Paul did house to house to house. No care for himself. No thoughts of like, am I going to wear out? Am I going to burn out? No. He was going to be spent for the Lord. From house to house, in verse 21, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This ministry looks a lot like Christ's ministry, doesn't it? Going about, doing all these things. I mean, he didn't do exactly the same things Christ did. Christ proclaimed the gospel. He preached. He healed. Look at verse 22. And now behold, bound by the Spirit... He, look, he's bound by the Romans. He's arrested. And again, he points, why am I in this position? Why am I here right now? It's for the sovereign hand of God that I'm bound by the Spirit. I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that the bonds and afflictions await me. He knows what he's going to. He knows he's going to die. Look at verse 24. But I do not consider my life 
of an account as dear to myself. Wait a second. Hold on. I want you to ask yourself this. Can you say that of yourself right now? He says it in half a sentence what humility really is. Can you say that for yourself? I do not consider my life of an account as dear to myself. This is the heart of Christ just bursting through Paul. Again, I don't see this in any candidate. Look at look what it says further. It says, so that I, might, that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 25. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. This is, this is, this is a goodbye. This is, I'm, I'm leaving you. You're, you're not going to see me this side, this side of heaven. You're not. It, it's a form of humility that, again, that is alien to society. It was alien then. It's alien today. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's alien even to church. That we don't see humility this way. We don't say, well, what does God want? What would God have me to do? Get a towel and wash someone's feet? Gross, right? Turn back to the Gospel of John. I mean, yes, chapter 13. Listen, what a life that Paul lived, right? If we, if we could have just 10% of Paul's life, if we could have 10% of Paul's humility, a life that expressed the love radiating through his life, a love for Christ, a service to the people, it's no surprise that the, the heart of love and humility are closely intertwined and it has its roots and, again, a, a love that he had from Christ. He loved his own, he says, and he loved his own to the end. And guess who he loved to the end? He loved Paul. And he loves you. And, and you think about how he, he promises that he'll love you, he'll persevere you to the end. It's, a, it's enough to humble you. Even I could close this and walk away right now. It's enough that you can say, why do I lack such humility? Why do I lack it so much when I see it so much in the face of my Savior? So I take you to this, back to Christ and how he's going to exemplify that for us. And it's in three points, a love and sanctification, love under betrayal, and love by example. Love in sanctification, love under betrayal, and love by example. Listen, this is, this is what he says. He, starting in verse 1, we're, we're near the point of Christ's departure. I remind you again, right? So he says this, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father. So we see this, it's Thursday evening, it's the Passover. They're celebrating God's rescue of the Israelites from Israel by, the, by a, a bloody sacrifice of a lamb. And, and Passover is to, to hand, uh, it is going to be hand in hand with, with Christ's own sacrifice. And Jesus begins to prepare his disciples for the true and last Passover meal, the only true and last Passover meal that will institute the Passover meal for us. Jesus being the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, right? John tells us frequently about the contrast of what is happening in this room. Not all is as it seems. There's more happening during this time than we could ever even understand. Because he says in verse 2, he goes from loving his own, and he goes in verse 2 
during supper, look what's happening. The devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. This is what's going on. There's a traitor among them. He's plotting the devil's work. And in the middle of this secret conflict, Jesus does something that not one of them thought he would ever do. It did not cross their mind even a little bit about what he's just about to do. But before this would happen, John reminds us of two things in verse 3. Look at verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hand, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. What does he remind them of? Jesus knowing all things. So none of these things are a surprise to Jesus. It, think, please. None of these things are a surprise to Jesus. I highlighted this last week. Think about everything that's happening. Not just Judas. Not just Judas, but all the disciples. He knows everything that's going to happen. He knows when they take him to trial that all of them are going to flee. They arrest him. They're all gone. And then he sees the whole scenario with Peter. Do you remember Peter? He's in the court. And they're asking him. He denies. Asking him. He denies. Asking him. He denies. Then the, the rooster crows. And in that moment, Jesus locks eyes with Peter. He knows this. Jesus knows this. He knew that Judas was going to betray him and the way he was going to betray him. Jesus also knew this. It's, Jesus was also sovereign over every action because the Father, it says, has given him all things into his hands. Not one thing that will happen was outside of Jesus' control. He had a grander purpose. Why does evil exist? Because God deems it to exist for his glory. People say, why does evil exist? Why do, why do innocent people die? Have you met an innocent person? There was one and they crucified him. That's it. He knows and the, God, the father had given all these things into his hands. And what did, he, what did he do? Knowing all these things and having true power over even his own betrayal? Look at verse 4. This is what he does. If any, anyone else knew this, they would not do this. He got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. You, you know what this means? He, he gets a towel, and he, he, he has his undergarments, but he wraps a towel around his waist. This is what they used to do. And it was long enough that it would kind of hang on the side, and then he would go from foot to foot to foot. Some of you I know, like, hate feet, you know? Like if someone has their dogs out, like it bothers you. Jesus decides to do the most menial. This, this task was given to slaves. Let me, let me explain something to you. In, in this culture, they wouldn't even, if there was a, a servant in the home that was Jewish, okay, they wouldn't even put another Jew to wash another Jew's feet, okay? So they would find the non-Jew in the home that's a servant or a slave, and they would put that person to wash the feet. This was the most demeaning task in all of the home. The lowest of the low. You, you could not get lower. And Jesus does this in the middle of the meal. He girds himself and he begins to do this. He goes from, listen, he goes from relating to them at the table to bringing himself beneath them.
dressing himself like a low, a lowly servant. The king of the universe, listen, <laughs> let me remind you one more time, the king of the universe becomes a servant to everyone in that room. He says something profound in verse 7. Look at verse 7. I'm going to jump down to verse 7. Jesus answered and said to him, what I, do, what, I, uh, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. He, he tells him, you, you, you don't fully understand this. I, I get that. You don't understand this. It's obvious that even Peter didn't understand this because of his response. Look at verse 5. He poured water in a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and wiped them with their towel. He says, then Simon says, Lord, do you wash my feet? Perplexed? What? You wash my feet? And this is not even the lowest way that Christ will express himself. He will go lower. Remember, despising the shame of the cross. To die on a cross, that, a tree that he created, men that he created, to drive nails through his hands and feet. That, that is a form of humility that we can never understand. Listen, we, we can't understand it. Some of the disciples understood it, murdered for their faith. Look at what he says in, in verse 8. It says, Never shall you wash my feet. Never. This is, this is uh, interesting. Like, Peter, you don't understand. You don't understand, Peter. He told him that already. This is, this, is, this is nothing in comparison to what will happen and what he'll do in a saving and sanctifying work in your life. He said, this is nothing. I love this because I think about the heart of David. You know, in, in Psalm 51, verse 2, David says this, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Ezekiel 36, verse 25 says this. There's a promise from, from the Lord himself long ago. It says this, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. You, you understand something. There, there, is, there is two things happening in this scenario. There is a simple just foot washing. It's just water. It's just a towel. But there's a profound understanding of Christ is actually doing in that moment. Did the water actually take away sin? No. But what was Christ giving them a word picture of what he, he was doing within their soul? Yes. Yes. He says it later on. But uh, turn with me so you can see this for yourself in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 in verse 22, it says this. Well, let me start in verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, since we have a confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, right? Later on, it talks about being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. It says, By a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. The, the incarnation, him coming down and veiling himself in the form of a man to do what you couldn't do for yourself, to live a life that was perfect, to atone on a cross for the sins of all those that would believe. He veiled himself for a time. And it says this, in verse 21, And since he, we have a great high priest over the house of God, Christ himself, right? Let us draw near with sincerity, with sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from any evil, from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This, this, is, this is the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. This is the sanctifying work of the cross itself. We're redeemed to be changed. 
And this is what the writer of Hebrews is telling us. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six, look at verse eleven. You remember this? That some of the greatest words, the the the, the most amazing five words in, in all of Scripture here in, in, in this verse. Verse eleven, such were some of you. Such were some of you. But what? But you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. This is what he's done. This this is the beauty of of what Christ is, the deeper sense of what he's actually doing and girding himself and telling, telling, out of all people, Peter, that should know better, the same Peter that confessed and in John 6, right? Where, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. He said that earlier, and now he's here. And, and Jesus tells him, you don't know what I'm doing, but you'll realize it later on. You will. But he doesn't understand because he goes from this extreme contrast. Lord, do you wash my feet? Like, no. I don't want you to do that. And Jesus tells him, if, if you don't want this, Jesus says, then you have no part with me. No part. And, and a lot like us, listen, a lot like us, we go to these extremes, right? Like we know the right thing to do, right? The Lord has already shown us and, and you don't have to pray about certain things because you know the right thing to do, right? And you say to yourself, I won't do it. I won't do it. I'm putting my foot down. And then you, we look ridiculous when the Lord corrects us, right? Because I don't tell you this right now. Peter doesn't look uh, very smart here. He Another one of those, you know, foot and mouth disease. Verse 9, Lord, then wash me. Not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. He thinks that he's going to this exaggerated response as if, he, as if Jesus is going to be impressed by what he said. No, don't. Yes, all of me. He says, then wash my feet, my hands, my head. Peter, you don't understand. I just told you you wouldn't understand this completely. It's not just foot washing. Look at verse 10. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but it's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. I love this. Jesus tells, Jesus tells Peter, I don't know if you catch this, but Jesus tells Peter, Peter, you're saved. If man, if if anyone would ever need any kind of assurance, he just got it. You're Peter, you're saved. You don't need your yes, you have your you walk around life and you dirty your feet in the world, but the rest of you has been sanctified and set apart for me. He he's given him this encouragement, like slow down. Slow down, Peter. This work I'm I'm doing, I've already I've already begun this work, and I'm going to finish it. I said that I would keep you to the end. Didn't he say that in verse one? Turn with me to Luke chapter seven to kind of understand this a little a little clearer. In Luke seven, there's a parable that that Jesus. Uh, gives us in the latter verses all the way to verse like 44 and it starts in verse 40 i'm not going to go through the whole parable but we have this where jesus has, is is at this feast he's inside the pharisee's home and he they begin to grumble and and obviously because this woman of ill repute comes in and 
she, she begins to cry all over Jesus' feet and then clean his feet with her hair. That's, that's, that's some profound foot washing, right? And, and then he says this. He turns towards the woman in verse 44. And he said to Simon, which is the Pharisee that was there, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. Simon, you did not show any hospitality towards me. You seen that my feet were dirty. You gave me no water for my feet. But what did she do? But she was, ha, has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. You gave me no greeting. You walk into the home, it's almost like they open the door and they just kind of like, ole, just walk in. No, no greeting, no nothing, you know? Walks in, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. It's not just washing the feet. He, she begins to kiss his feet. What a form of humility. Verse 46, you do, not, you do not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many. Remember, such were some of you. Her sins that are many have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. She loved much. Let's just switch the word. Listen, all the titles I just gave you to even my points, they all could be revert. It says love, put humility there. Love and sanctification. You see it here? She, she was humble because of her sin that it equated to love when she came to Christ. She seen her need for Christ and lowered herself. Not because Jesus was saying to, to the ground, wash my feet. No, it was no necessity for that. She walked in and says, I need, I need you, Jesus. I need you. You don't need me. And this is the gospel today, isn't it? People plead as if Jesus needs you. He doesn't need you. You need him. You need to humble yourself. You don't have an answer for your sin. And you have a lack of love because you don't know God's love. We love him because he first loved us. He is the first cause of love. And he does this with his people. He says, look, I'm doing this. Peter, you're clean. Turn back to the gospel. Peter, you're clean. But then he says, he tells them, right at the end, he says, but not all of you. I, I could say the same this morning to you. Not all of you. Unfortunately, it's sad, but not all of you are clean. Not all of you have come to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. So we, we see this picture, the love under betrayal, this, this love that Christ had is betrayed. And, and the story, listen, how is it betrayed? Because who is he talking about? He's talking about Judas. The story of Judas, the, most, the greatest tragedy ever illustrated before us in a life that was blind by what? By self-ambition and sin. Judas wanted what he wanted. And he didn't care about anybody else. And this betrayal ends in the most grotesque denial and, and backstabbing of all of history. We talk about this. Look, at, no one even, again, we talk about this. You don't even name your dog Judas. You know, if I, had a, if I had a pet snake, I wouldn't call him Judas. This is, he's, his life is just such a, such a waste. 
No one has been exposed to more of Jesus' life and still betrayed them than Judas himself. He still turns his back on him. Jesus, I mean, Judas lived around Jesus. He was exposed to his teaching, exposed to his miracles, exposed to his compassion, exposed to his love, and yet sold the God of glory, the Son of God, for 30 pieces of silver. Maybe no one has ever sold their soul for less, but I would argue that there, there is many still that sell it for less. John had already exposed the heart of Judas. He already did this. Turn back to John chapter 6. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 67. This is at the cusp of, of, of Peter's confession. It says, Jesus in verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? That, that might have been a good moment for Judas to just expose himself and say, yeah, I'm gone. I'm leaving too. He didn't. Simon Peter answered, you guys know this. He says, Lord, to whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. We see this interaction in verse 68. He says this, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You know, he, he puts that we in there, speaking for all the disciples, obviously because Peter doesn't know. He doesn't know among them that he they have, they have a Judas, they have a betrayer. Verse 70, Jesus answered him, do I... Do I myself not, did I myself not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? One of you is a a devil. And then John gives us the the commentary in verse 71. says, now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. This is, look at chapter 12. What a tragedy. Chapter 12, verse 4. But Judas is scary. Do you remember this? That Mary anoints Jesus, his his head and his feet. And and he's over here. Hey, you know what? That wasn't in the budget, guys. Right? Verse 4. But Judas is scary. One of the disciples who was intending to betray him said, Why was this perfume, listen to the arrogance, not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? You don't care about the poor, Judas. This sounds a lot like this nonsense that goes around today, right, with CRT and BLM. You don't care about them. You take in millions. Then what do you do with it? Judas. You don't care about them. He's like, no. Why wasn't it sold? I'll tell you why it wasn't sold, because you're a rat, Judas. You're fake, a phony. It says, now he said this in verse 6, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, so he was a treasurer, they trusted him. He used to pilfer what was put into it. So he was taking a little bit off the top and a little off the bottom too. Might as well. This is Judas. Turn back to chapter 13. Look at verse 11. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. He gives commentary. This is why he said this, John says. Verse 18. I do not speak of all of you. I know that one that that. The, the ones I have chosen. I know the ones I've chosen, and it is the scripture, that scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. He quotes an old psalm, and he says, you know what? To lift up your heel is to, to, to give disgrace, to disdain to someone. And later on, you'll see this because of the morsel, right? He grabs that bread. Judas was exposed to demonic control. Listen, because of unbelief. 
At this point, Satan had, it says, put into Judas's heart to betray Jesus. Put into his heart. Judas's own hard-heartedness had made it possible for Satan to give to 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 be given him this desire to do the worst treacherous act ever. Judas had most literally committed cosmic treason. Later it got much worse. In Luke 22 verse 3 it says this that Satan entered Judas. His end would be solidified by Satan's own possession of Judas to conspire against Jesus' enemies because he goes to the high priest to make plans to have Jesus arrested and murdered. This was all happening in the most amazing narrative that Jesus is teaching about humility to his disciples. If they knew the background, think about this, if they knew the background of what was happening in Judas's heart, wouldn't this humility even be further highlighted? Wouldn't you think to yourself, he even washed Judas's feet? But Judas would have none of it. Listen, the life of Judas is played out in real time every Sunday. Every Sunday, among us, the heart of Judas still exists. The New Testament begins to call it the, the, the heart of the Antichrist. Not that you're against Christ. That doesn't, that's not what it means. Is that you would be so indifferent that you would expose yourself, as Judas exposed himself, to the desires of the devil. You see this earlier in John, it says he's talking to the Pharisees, the religious ones, and he says, you are the sons of the devil. And the, the, the things that he desires, you desire to do. People attend church, like a Lord's Day service just like this, are exposed to the life of Christ, hear about his glorious life, his miracles, his teaching, his call to surrender by faith to the gospel, Yet every Sunday, the heart of Judas grows colder and harder, further and farther away from God. Until one day, they turn their back on him in a true finality. You may say, I don't, I don't despise Jesus. Pastor, I don't despise him. I, I wouldn't sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I would say you're right. Your rejection of him is less than 30 pieces of silver. Your, your denial of him is cheaper than what Judas did. It's not worse. It just costs you less. All you have to do is just close your ears and shut your heart to him. He asks for your life, surrendered, and you say, no, mine. This is my life. Luke 9.24 says this, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake he is the one who will save it. You have a death grip on your own life. Judas had that same grip. In the end, he sacrificed his own life. He had no one to blame but himself. My last point, I'm running out of time here, so we'll take this to next week, but love by example... Again, I would love to expand this point, but we'll, and we will next week. But I want to give a, a cursory thought of, of what Jesus says next in verses 12 to 17. And look at verse 12. 
So when he had washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined on the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Jesus goes back to the robe because he, he takes off the girding of the towel and puts on the robe again. Then he goes back to the table to take his place again with them as peers. But not really. Because he tells them, I'm your teacher and Lord. And he opens it by asking this question, do you know what I have done to you? Do you understand what I've just done? I love this because most of us with, with, will stay quiet, right? I've, I've asked this question like if I'm, in, I'm moderating on Saturday morning and ask a question and it's like a simple question. Everybody stays real quiet because they think I'm, I'm trying to do some trickery, right? And sometimes it's true of me, okay? But it's not true of Jesus. He asks this question and no one answers. No one answers. And it is true to actually stay quiet because his answer or his explanation, what he did was going to be more profound than anything they could, they could say. This one moment of what Jesus is going to explain to them will, de- will literally define the rest of their lives. Everything after, his, after this, after this interaction from chapter 13 to 17, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, everything after all these things will define their whole lives and then it will bring clarity. A clarity that they couldn't have before it. This is, listen, this is not a call to the church to, to begin to start doing foot washing, okay? I know some churches do that. <laughs> I'm not opposed to it. But this is not, this is a principle. And, and he, he's telling them about this pr- principle. And apparently to them that, that later on this, this would affect their ministries and shape everything that they do. Based on a few words, verse 14, the first part, it says, If I then, in the middle of the verse it says, you also. If I then, you also. I think everything that we see in our lives should be based on that. If he then did this, then I will do that. Nothing is beneath a believer's calling. Do you understand? Nothing is beneath you. This is why Judas hated this message. It destroyed his whole life. Why? Because it did, it did damage to his, his pride. And it does damage to our pride, doesn't it? Believers, you are called to be humble. Not because it will bring some sense of worth to your life, because it does, it does do that, but not because of that. That's not our motivation, because it will bring glory to the Lord. That's why. In closing, I say this. The Lord Jesus came to serve, and Mark 10, 45 says, I came to serve and not to be served. This is the model of what a believer is and not uh, not one that desires to take or to be served, but the one that sees sees Christ and what he's done and says, I can never outdo my Lord. I can never outgive him. But you could say, I will spend the rest of my life trying though. That's what Paul did, didn't he? You see, Mark 10, 45 ends with this. The second half of the verse, he says, but to serve, and he gave his life a ransom for many. You are redeemed to serve. Redeemed to exemplify humility. The calling to, of the redeemed is to live a life that is sacrificed towards him. Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? A living sacrifice. 
And in so doing, we give the world a view of what a transformed life, a ransomed life looks like. Not living for ourselves, but for him. Pray with me. Father, we are so in awe of your greatness, of your love towards your own and and what you called your church to be and to do. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to exemplify humility. And even in doing that, Lord, that we would show the world what it looks like to love you, to abandon any kind of pride that says, I could save myself. To abandon any kind of loves that would keep us from you. A type of love that is, that is disgusting. That would reject the work of your son. Lord, help those that have not yet come to know you. That this morning, for your glory and your praise, or that you would save them. That you'd grant them repentance and faith. That they would not trust in themselves. That they would trust only in your son. And in doing so, they would come to know him and love him. Lord, for your church, strengthen her in these truths. Help us, Lord, to first, within the church, let's show humility towards one another. And in doing so, bring glory to all that you are and all that you've done. We're asking Christ's name. Amen.